Hello, and today we're going to be talking about the Southeast Asian realm, continu continuing on with our lectures of parts of Asia. So let's go ahead and take a look at this realm as a whole. The Southeast Asian realm is divided into two sections. Um, there is the mainland section, which is going to be this portion up here, and the insular regions. Insular refers to islands, and uh, of course, very much of this realm consists of lots of islands. Okay, so we're kind of going to divide the realm into those two pieces as we talk more about individual countries. All right, so on the mainland, um, the countries that we have here is going to be Myanmar, also known as Burma. We'll talk about in our next lecture um, the difference between the term Myanmar versus Burma and who uses which term and why. Um, for, re for reference, the United States government currently uses the term Burma, but the government of Myanmar uses the term Myanmar. Okay, we have Thailand through here, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. All right, and then if we move on to looking to the island uh, portions of this region, we have the Philippines through here. We have Indonesia, all this portion in green, uh, Malaysia up here, and then I have Brunei, and I have East Timor, also known as Timor-Leste, and I also have Singapore right over here. Okay. So if you look at the climate of this region, we are in what's called um, the tropical climate category, um, also known as the A climate category, if we're looking at the Köppen climate system. So this photo here is from um, Pattaya in southern Thailand. So the tropical climate category is, as it sounds, going to be located in the tropics. So we're going to be focused around the equator. And as you saw in our previous map here, I guess there's no equator located here, but the equator runs right through this realm. Going to be going right about here is going to be where um, my equator is located, okay? So we're firmly in the tropics. In fact, only portions of Myanmar are outside of that tropics. Again, we're going to be in between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn is going to be your definition of the tropics. So because we're in the tropical part of the world, it definitely makes sense that we're going to be in the tropical climate category. So uh, one of the big markers of this climate category is it is always warm. So if I look year round, the average temperature, even if, if it's the dead of winter, right, your average temperature is always above 18 degrees Celsius. And for those of you in the U.S., that's about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's an average. Of course, quite often the countries we see here are significantly warmer. Okay, um, so we're always warm. And this is, of course, because the sun is going to be always overhead. So if you think about our earth is tilted, 23 and a half degrees. And so different parts of the world are going to be getting more direct sunlight. And then parts of the world are going to be getting more um, uh, tangential sunlight. Kind of like if you skip a rock, it kind of bounces across the surface. And those is going to be tangential rays. We're going to see that more in our um, polar regions like we saw in our um, European and our Russian realms. Okay, but here in the tropics, we have the sun is directly overhead. We're going to have um, nice long days. We have high quality sunlight coming through. And all this is going to create more temperature, more warmth. All right. This part of the world, that, well, I should say this particular tropical climate category is also quite wet. That is a big feature of the A um, climate category. And so you have parts of this realm that are going to be rainy year round, where you just have three o'clock in the afternoon every day, here comes thunderstorm. And you also have portions of the world of this realm that are going to have um, dry periods during the winter months. Now it's important to note, unlike our B climate category, which we saw in North Africa, Southwest Asia, we're not going to have the same type of deficit that we do um, there. Okay, so for example, we'll talk more about the, um, the dry period, what we call the tropical savanna, when we get into our sub-Saharan Africa realm. But um, in parts of the tropical category that do have dry winter months, you can have a deficit in those winter months, but the amount of rain you get then in the summer bounces it out so your entire region is not going to be a desert. Okay, so if you think about um, um, savanna type uh, vegetation that you might see, um, you know, uh, 
uh, grasslands with a few trees. We see that in this realm of Southeast Asia as well. Again, not a full desert, but you do still, still have some portions of uh, water deficit. But overwhelmingly, um, much of this realm of Southeast Asia is going to be always warm and always wet. Um, so lots of moisture and lots of warmth. And that, of course, is going to mean lots of happy plants, and happy plants make happy animals, okay? Because of all of this warmth and water, which of course are the two big things that plants need to grow, we have a massive amount of biodiversity in this realm. In fact, Indonesia is second in biodiversity only to Brazil, all right? And this is going to be talking about the diversity of different types of life. So plants and animals. Much of this realm is going to be uh, tropical rainforest. So we do have rainforests through here. Um, so all those pictures you have of, of massive trees and vegetation definitely applies to this realm. Uh, here are some of the animals that we see in this realm. For example, the Bornean orangutan, uh, Sumatran tiger, the Irrawaddy dolphin, and the pygmy slow loris. Um, many of these animals are going to be considered endangered. Um, for a different number of reasons, some of them is going to be from the pet trade. For example, our pygmy slow loris is absolutely adorable and will make a great pet, right? No, please do not have wild animals as pets. They are not pets. Um, but there is a, a large market for animals um, taken from the wild to be kept as pets by someone who doesn't know better or doesn't care. Um, same thing for wild cats as well. You have people who think that they can just own a tiger. No big deal. Um, and, and primates as well. Um, less so with orangutans and more with chimpanzees. So some of this is going to be the illegal uh, wildlife trade. Um, people taking animals from the wild to keep in, in captivity. Um, so this is going to be hunting for food or for pelts. So for example, the tiger, not just the Sumatran tiger, there are many different species of tiger. Um, but, the, but the Sumatran tiger is going to be one that has um, can be hunted for its pelts um, or um, use in traditional medicine. I'm not sure about the Sumatran tiger specifically, but other types of tigers are definitely hunted for use in traditional medicine. Um, Habitat loss is a big one for orangutans. We'll see a lot of the uh, orangutans um, habitat is being burned down. Um, so there's lots of different things that impact um, these animals and, and their ability to survive. But it's important to know that when we talk about biodiversity, we're not just looking at number of species. So if, for example, if I have a classroom full of human students, you might say, wow, the biodiversity of this classroom is low because there's only one species there and that's human. Maybe there's some ants and flies, but for the most part, it's just humans, okay? So in terms of number of species, that classroom would have a low number of diversity, just one species. But we also look at um, genetic diversity as well. And that's a very important aspect of animal and plant conservation. Of course, that same classroom of students um, would have a, a large number of, of biodiversity of genes, um, especially if we are here in the Bay Area. We are a very diverse part of the world. Um, so it's important to look at the genetics of your population because if you don't have genetic diversity, you can have what's called a genetic bottleneck. Okay, and that's going to be a big concern for a lot of our conservation efforts. So let's think about this hourglass here. If I have a large number of animals, so we'll say, I don't know, panda bears, right? Everyone likes pandas. So a large number of pandas, and then something happens that kills off a lot of the pandas. So maybe there was a forest fire, maybe they were hunted, maybe they got sick. Something happened, and a large number of animals died. So you can see how my bottleneck forms, right? I've reduced the number of organisms that are able to breed, okay? Now, um, throughout the world, we have a lot of different breeding programs. Uh, we have one right in the Bay Area here for the African penguins. There is a breeding program um, at the California County of Sciences. And so um, this is to, to help these animals uh, match up their genetics to increase the number of organisms, okay? So you can come out of this, this bottleneck here and have more animals. But if you have more animals, that doesn't fix the problem of genetics. 
Now, genetics are very complicated. I am not going to attempt to go into a genetic lecture here, but genetics, of course, is going to dictate not just what organisms look like, you know, color of fur, number of toes, whatever, but also things like um, propensity for different illnesses, um, ability to overcome certain um, resiliency, you know, um, adaptations um, for eating better food or surviving climate change, whatever, right? So your genetics predicts so much of, of your life. So let's say, for example, I've got pandas again, and all the pandas have died, and I only have six pandas left in the world, okay? And so if we have a breeding program for these six pandas, um, we can pair them up and we can breed them. We can have, you know, we can totally bring back the panda population. But that doesn't change that the amount of genetics that we started with is still the original six. Now, where this becomes a concern is one of our pandas has the genes for evil panda syndrome. That's not a real thing. It just, it, it looks nice on this diagram, okay? So that panda has a genetic mutation. So if these pandas here produce three offspring, and these pandas here produce three offspring, so through, again, breeding programs, we're increasing the number of animals we have, because of this panda here has a genetic um, uh, mutation, then it's very possible that those mutations get passed on to its offspring, okay? So I could have 10,000 million pandas, right? But it's not gonna change that a certain percentage of them are gonna have this mutation. Okay, this is why inbreeding is such a big concern. And again, when we have these breeding programs with scientists and zoos and museums, they're very careful about which animals they match up with because you don't want to have inbreeding. This happens, of course, to humans as well. For example, if we look at um, the royalty of Europe, uh, once upon a time, it was very important that royalty only married royalty. And since royalty in Europe was hereditary, it means you were marrying your relatives. And so we did see a high number of different genetic defects in um, certain members of the royal family, not the current one. Um, but for example, the story of Anastasia, who was um, the daughter of the last czar of Russia, um, her brother Nicholas had hemophilia, which can be a genetic, um, is a genetic um, uh, mutation where your blood doesn't clot. There's lots of other um, things that we were coming up in not just the European royal family and other royal um, ruling families throughout the world. Anytime you have an emphasis on you must marry and, um, and breed with a relative, you increase this bottleneck, you increase this probability of more genetic mutations, which can be fatal, which can be very detrimental to um, your health. So this is a concern in terms of genetic diversity, because even if we stop all of the destruction of rainforests and we do these intensive breeding programs, that, that doesn't necessarily save the species, okay? So we have species that are weaker genetically because they just have so few breeding pairs, all right? Um, this is also a concern because if there is an illness, this can wipe out the entire um, species. So for example, bananas, if you like bananas, <laughs> um, the remaining bananas are really kind of all from one strain, at least the bananas that you buy at like the supermarket. This is not looking at um, native plantains. But all the bananas that are left are the results of really just one genetic strain because the other ones were wiped out by disease. So if another disease comes back, you may no longer have bananas, right? That's pretty significant, <laughs> right? Um, or the potato blight that we, in Ireland, right? Any of these, anything you have, your genetics are all focused on one tiny small chunk of your genetic code, you are just more vulnerable to illnesses. And that's something, a big concern in modern day agriculture, because throughout the world, much of our agriculture is um, reproduced not through sexual breeding, but through um, propagation techniques that just preserve those genetics, because everyone wants their banana to be the same color of yellow and the same amount of ripeness and the same amount of sweetness. So when you get that one delicious type of apple, we just kind of clone them, literally, um, clone apples or clone strawberries or whatnot to reproduce that magical color and shape and size and flavor that looks so good on the Safeway shelf. But um, 
but that means that we're more susceptible to illnesses. Okay, so I digress. We're supposed to be talking about pandas, but this impacts not just our endangered pandas, but also our agriculture as well. Um, so what's happening to these, the, not just pandas, but all the other organisms um, in this realm is we're kind of stuck in between eco economy versus ecosystem. Okay, um, so two of the major crops of this realm are going to be coffee. This is what coffee looks like before it gets to your coffee cup. Okay, so this is what a coffee tree looks like. And um, palm oil. So this here is a palm oil plantation. And of course, coffee and palm oil are extensively used, especially in Western diets. Um, probably most of you drink coffee, right? Coffee, many of us cannot function without coffee. But you may not realize that palm oil is in so much that you consume. So palm oil is used quite a bit in um, baked goods, especially those that you would find on the shelf. So for example, if you go to the store and you're buying a packaged pastry or it's in a lot of, um, you know, nutrition bars and frozen pizzas and all, you know, some Nutella has it, all sorts of different um, preserved baked um, goods that you would find on, on the shelf, right? So it's, it's, I'm not really correct, quite sure why we use it. It's probably some type of, of preserving agent of some sort. Um, but palm oil is very extensively used in a lot of, of um, non-fresh goods, I should say, packaged goods, okay? Both of these are going to be tropical plants, so they need lots of warmth and lots of water, which is why they're so perfect for growing in this part of the world, because we have lots of warmth and lots of water here. Now, if you think about um, the coffee, it's actually not even a tree. It looks kind of tree-like here. It's kind of more like a shrub, <laughs> right? It's a low shrub. It's Most of you are probably taller than a coffee tree would be. Um, this is an organism that can grow underneath on the understory of plants. So again, we have rainforests throughout this realm, which means lots of tall trees. And these coffee trees, coffee shrubs, can happily grow in the understory beneath all those trees. But that's a pain to have to harvest them, right? It's hard to have to crawl into the forest and pick all the berries and they're not going to get super big because they're in the shade. So if I want to make more coffee and sell more coffee, I'm going to cut down all the other trees. So now my coffee berries are like in direct sunlight and I'm going to pump them through full of water and fertilizer <laughs> so they just make more coffee all the time, right? So we're kind of hijacking the, the, the natural way that these plants want to grow um, in the effort of having higher productivity, okay? Um, because, you know, palm trees and coffee berries, these exist in nature without human interference, but the way that humans now need them in large scale and need them to be commercially viable to make money, um, we're growing them at a larger scale. Uh, and because we're doing them at a larger scale, it means that in some parts of the world, we're implementing uh, a different type of agriculture, which we call slash and burn. So this picture here is in Thailand. As you can see, uh, much of the forest has been burned down. So slash and burn agriculture is also known as shifting agriculture. So if I have a large rainforest and I want to grow some food, okay, um, Parts of the, the forest are cut down, so that's the slash part. We, we cut them all down, and then we burn them, all right? And so now I have this patch of land here that is, is, is cleared so I can plant whatever crops I want. And um, the nice thing is, is that the fire actually returns nutrients to the soil. So throughout the world, um, fire is used in agriculture for a number of different reasons. But one reason can be to return the nutrients of all those dead trees that you just chopped down, return that nutrients back to the soil because rainforest soils are actually not good for agriculture. Okay, and this is because of the high amount of rain we have in this part of the world. So think about coffee, right? If you are a coffee drinker, when you make coffee at home, right? You have your coffee grounds, or maybe you drink tea, whatever. You have your coffee grounds, right? So you run your water through your coffee grounds, and your your water runs through those coffee grounds and it takes with it all the delicious flavor and caffeine and color of the coffee and now you have a cup of water that is um, flavored and caffeinated and colored like coffee. Well what if you try to use those coffee grounds a second time or a third time? 
right? Same with tea, right? I drink a tea and sometimes I try to get that second cup out of my tea bag, right? It's not as strong the second time around and definitely not the third time around because all of that flavor and color and caffeine has already been washed out of your coffee. The same thing happens with the rainforest soils, okay? So soils in the tropical region are not good for agriculture because there's so much rain. The reason why there are so many amazing biodiversity here is because it becomes a cycle. If I have lots of trees and they drop their leaves and die and I have lots of cool animals. So, you know, some beetles die, some monkeys die, that their, their decaying organisms return nutrients to the soil. Okay, so our life is dependent on the previous life that has died to create this cycle. Okay, when we remove that, when we cut down all the trees, we no longer have leaf litter and dead monkeys or whatever going in to replenish my soil. So slash and burn at a small scale, emphasis on small scale, um, can, can return nutrients to the soil. Okay, can we, by burning it, we are returning that nutrients into the soil. Okay. Now, um, growing, because soil isn't good in the tropics, growing um, crops this way doesn't last for very long, okay, because your soil gets tapped out. So the idea of the shifting part of shifting agriculture is you would farm this piece of land for, you know, five years, whatever, and then the soil is tapped out and then you move on to the new patch of land. So you'd have to slash and burn the neighboring portion of land to move your crops there. Okay. When this is done at a small scale and it has been for generations, humans have done this. Okay. If you were just feeding a small village, if you're just feeding um, that subsistence agriculture, just enough to feed you and your family, this is sustainable because you allow that place to, to be fallow and to grow back and so you would not go back to that area for you know decades let it grow back and, and heal and then you know generations from now go back and reburn that first spot so you kind of just like you know move your farm in a little circle throughout generations however uh, this is not going to produce enough products to sell on a global scale and remember we're here to make money so um, if we do this on a large scale it can be devastating okay and so this slash and burn agriculture is happening um a lot in the use of um palm oil palm oil especially but also with coffee and so orangutans especially are we're seeing a lot of um orphaned orangutans or orangutans with a lot of burns because they're in the forest when it gets set on fire um there are orangutan preserves there are are places that are you know trying to um, be a safe haven for these animals but um Habitat loss is a huge problem uh, for the animals and plants living in this realm because when, you know, you look at this amount of land here, this has all been been cut down and these are, this is now a plantation. These are all little palm palm trees here, right? This is all the, the natural vegetation has been cut down and just planted with these palm trees so that you can have your delicious baked pastry, right? Um, so that's a big concern is, is how, but we, we how do we um, respect the ecosystem because we want, you know, our animals and plants to be healthy, but also how do we feed our humans, right? How do we pay for human needs? So that's a, a big um, poll here is how do you balance the economy with the ecosystem, all right? The way we're currently running it is not sustainable. Eventually, after we've burned all this land, um, because we're not, you know, going back in that cycle, that generational cycle, the nutrients isn't going to ha isn't going to come back. So we're forced to put more um, fertilizer through here, which is of course very expensive. So this method is not sustainable, and the land eventually will give out. So humans have to decide how do we want to continue to provide for our economy and, and sell things in a way that doesn't completely tap out the earth's resources. Okay. So something really cool about this realm is we see a lot of really interesting volcanoes and earthquakes, especially in our island portion of this realm. It's a major tectonic activity. So um, depending on how old you are, you might remember the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, which impacted um, Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia. 
Um, this was a tsunami that was caused by an earthquake in the ocean. Um, and so a tsunami is a giant wave. And um, the earthquake occurred in the ocean, and that's what triggered this giant wave. So that hit um, Sumatra, one of the islands of Indonesia. Um, Mount Pinatubo was a volcanic eruption in the Philippines in the 90s. And actually the ash and soot from Mount Pinatubo within um, within like three months, it covered a large portion, like 40% 40, 40 of the um, planet. Just kind of showing how much one volcano can impact the entire globe. I think the average global temperature dropped like half a degree Celsius because of the amount of soot and ash from one volcano. And I'm going to assume none of you were born in 1883, but in 1883 we had the eruption of Mount Krakatoa, which was very spectacular. So you can see from this diagram here, originally this island, this is going to be again in Indonesia, it's, this island is in between Sumatra and Java. So all this dotted island here is where Krakatoa used to be. <laughs> and then one giant, uh, giant eruption literally blew up the island. Um, so all of this dotted portion here is, is gone. It's, it's obliterated. Um, and uh, so there is Anak Krakatoa, which means son of Krakatoa. There is a, a smaller um, volcano, or I should say a smaller island still remnant from that volcano. So it is possible to have more activity here. This is just these three examples of, again, big volcanoes, big earthquakes. All right. Um, so volcanoes can be very devastating. All right. So Krakatoa, of course, completely destroyed this island and everyone on it. Um, there weren't really any survivors of folks who, who, <coughs> who were living on the island. <coughs> but the silver lining is volcanic soil is very rich and fertile. Okay. Again, talking about all those nutrients. Right, so volcanic soil is going to be great for agriculture. So if we look at the four islands of Indonesia, Java is overwhelmingly the, the most heavily populated because of this rich, fertile volcanic soil. Okay, we see um, volcanoes throughout the realm, but there's a, a high number of them in Java. Um, so that's great for agriculture. Okay, but it's this humans have to decide, you know, I can I can grow food here, but I have to understand that my life could be in danger because of the volcano. Um, we see this in Hawaii as well, is um, the volcano is a, is a crucial part of um, that area's uh, physical attributes as well as cultural, but then of course it can be very destructive as well. So why do we so, see so many volcanoes and earthquakes in this realm particularly? And that's because we are on um, some major tectonic plates. Woohoo! So if here, here of course is our, our realm. So here's going to be my my mainland realm through here, and we've got our insular region through here. Okay, and you can see there's a lot of different plates. Now in our last lecture, I talked about how um, there are lots of micro plates, smaller plates, and so here now you can see some more of these smaller plates. And these smaller plates might not show up on um, some of uh, the bigger maps, but you can see lots of plates moving around. All right, so everywhere there's a line is going to be a boundary between different plates. If you see a blue triangle line like this one here, that means that this plate, the Pacific plate, is being smushed or subducted beneath these plates. So we've got the Philippine plate through here, and I think this is the tail end of the North um, North American plate, I'm not entirely positive, okay? So you've got a lot of smushing of plates all through here. This is gonna create a lot of um, ridges and a lot of trenches. So for example, we've got the Mariana Trench is gonna be right here as the Pacific plate is being subducted through here. You're also going to have some of those spreading zones, okay? So like this red portion through here, I'm going to have these pieces here are actually getting larger. So I could say the Philippine Sea is actually getting a bit bigger, okay? And then those side-to-side -side motions through here. So again, everywhere you see these lines are going to be locations for more volcanoes and, um, and more earthquakes, okay? So again, you know, earthquake through here that uh, triggered the... Um, the Sumatra tsunami, uh, Kakatoa is going to be over here. Um, and then again, this line, and then so Philippines, of course, is where Mount Panatubo is. So lots of volcanic activity because you have so many plates grinding back and forth. Okay. And in fact, if you look on a bigger scale, da -da -da, we call this area the Ring of Fire. Okay. Um, so the Ring of Fire is going to be this nice 
circular region that is full of fire in the form of volcanoes and earthquakes. Okay, so again, back to that Pacific plate, which we saw here, right? This big piece over here is all my Pacific plate. And this blue triangle means that my Pacific plate is moving beneath all the, so I'm moving beneath here, I'm going beneath here, I'm getting, I'm actually growing a bit over here. Okay, so what's happening is this Pacific plate, it's a very large plate, so all this piece here in the middle, it's actually moving towards the northwest. As it's moving towards the northwest, it's going to be subducted, which means smooshed beneath both the Filipino plate over here and the North American plates up through here. Okay, um, so as we look at Hawaii, for example, Hawaii is literally getting closer to Japan over time. Okay, Hawaii is getting closer to Japan because this plate is moving up this way. And eventually someday Hawaii will be beneath Japan because that's how subduction works. Okay, we see a lot of these uh, major trenches. Okay, so again, the Marianas Trench is a very popular deep trench. Challenger Deep is like the deepest point in the world. It's actually deeper than Mount Everest is tall. We have lots of trenches through here. Also lots of islands, many of which are volcanic. We have lots of volcanoes in Alaska, for example. Okay, and then of course a lot of mountain ranges. So think about all the mountains we have through here, all the mountains we have through here, mountains in here. A lot of this, those are going to be um, mountains that orogenesis caused again by that accumulation material. If I smush a bunch of land together, it's going to be forced upwards. Okay, so all along this ring of fire, we see a high amount of volcanoes and earthquakes. Of course, um, New Zealand gets lots of nasty earthquakes. And all that is a result of tectonic activity. Okay, so in our boundaries lecture, we talked about the four different types of boundaries. All four of those types of boundaries can be found right here in the Southeast Asian realm. Okay, so for example, the antecedent boundary is one that's created before populations have settled. We see this on the island of Borneo. So Borneo is split between uh, multiple countries. We have um, Indonesia and, oops. So Borneo, the island of Borneo, consists of, of three different countries. So Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei all have um, pieces on Borneo. But if those boundaries are put in place before people move there, then no one gets moved around. Subsequent boundaries are ones that are, are um, adjusted. They're moved in after uh, population have settled and then get adjusted as as settlements kind of settle themselves out. And that's going to be in between China and Vietnam. We'll talk more in a bit about the influence of China on Vietnam. But the border between China and Vietnam has changed. All right. It kind of changes depending on populations and in politics. Um, superimposed boundaries are those created by an entity outside of location. So colonialism. So um, this is completely ignoring um, all of the cultural and different ethnic groups here. So um, it, it'd be it's very fraught, a lot of, of trauma and a lot of damage to the people living there because their cultures are just not respected. So the island of New Guinea, for example, is cut into two different um, countries. So parts of Indonesia for the western portion and then the eastern portion is a different country, is Papua New Guinea. And this cut here was done by colonial forces. It was not, the people there were not consulted whatsoever. And so another example of this would be the um, partition in India that we saw in our previous lecture. And then relic boundaries are ones that used to have a major historical significance, but no longer are used. And so that would be the 17th parallel in between North and South Vietnam. So again, um, Vietnam is now united into one country, but once upon a time it was split. And the 17th parallel was where that split occurred. So um, that relic boundary is still significant. Um, so for example, people who were studying the Vietnam War or maybe who served in the Vietnam War, so veterans can go back and visit this um, to pay respect to their fallen comrades. So it still has a major historical significance, but it's not actually a political uh, boundary any longer. So all four types we see right here in Southeast Asia. Um, of course, colonialism had a major impact on this realm. The only country in this realm to have not been colonized is Thailand. 
So if you ever heard the term Siam, that's referring to the kingdom of Thailand. It was of Thailand. It was originally the kingdom of Siam. So um, in order to stay independent and to stay sovereign, Siam did have to lose a lot of its land to colonizers to appease them. Okay. So uh, Thailand being the only non-colonized country through here. We saw a lot of European forces, um, French especially. So for example, <coughs> um, the French had control over um, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. So there are parts of Southeast Asia that still speak French to this day. Um, Spain had control over the Philippines, which you can see in the fact that many people of, um, who are Filipino are Catholic, much like the country of Spain. Um, the Dutch controlled um, all of what is now Indonesia, so all of this through here. And so you may have heard the term the East, uh, or, or, so the Caribbean was sometimes called the West Indies, that, you know, when Columbus, the, the, the urban legend is that Columbus landed there and thought he was India. No, he knew where he was. Um, so, so um, if the Caribbean is referred to as the West Indies, the reason why is because this portion here was called the Dutch East Indies because it was colonized by the Dutch. And that's going to be all of Indonesia was the East Indies. And then we had the Brits were going to be in uh, Myanmar or Burma and Malaysia and was now in Brunei. Um, and then, of course, uh, the Japan also had a huge impact here, we'll see in the next slide. Okay, so the newest country in this realm is going to be East Timor, this guy down here, sometimes called Timor Leste, and they uh, became independent from Portugal in 2002, which was quite exciting. So this entire um, island originally was annexed to Indonesia in the 1970s, but there continued to be um, tensions until finally, again, 2002, when um, East Timor became independent. Okay, so they are doing a lot of work with offshore oil drilling, which when we do our um, Australia realm, we'll look at how uh, drilling underwater gets complicated when it comes to boundaries. All right, so remember the way that boundaries work is everything beneath that magical invisible line belongs to that country. Well, when you're in the ocean, it gets trickier on how to decide where the lines are. Um, because when we get to international and maritime law, there are different um, different types of, of boundaries and borders. Okay, so that'll, we'll talk about that later. But that's a big portion of the economy for East Timor is, is offshore drilling. All right. So I mentioned um, Japan having a major colonial enforce in this realm. So here's looking at, again, Japan being here. We'll talk about them in our, our East Asia lecture later. Um, but starting in the 1860s, Japan began to expand its territory, and that definitely included Southeast Asia. So as you can see, um, beginning in the 1930s, all the way until, you know, the uh, World War II, Japan controlled, again, much of this realm, excepting Thailand. But all of the other portions in here were were controlled by um, by Japan, and parts of China were as well um, controlled by Japan. Okay, um, this, this of course this is going to be what we call the Pacific Theater for World War II. So there were many um, island and naval and air battles fought throughout this realm um, in World War II, and the native peoples here um, did suffer terribly, uh, both in terms of, of actual battle conflicts and also um, at, in forced labor camps for the Japanese. Okay. As we saw following the end of World War II, just as it did with Europe, Japan also then um, lost their colonies. And so really following World War II, we saw worldwide a lot of colonies start to begin their gain their independence. And so starting in the 1940s, you see these different um, countries through here begin to gain independence. It's more complicated than that, of course. So for example, Vietnam, um, prior to um, World War II, it was controlled by the French, then the French lost it to the Japanese. And then when the Japanese left, the French tried to get it back, which then brings us to um, the Vietnam War. <laughs> All right, so many Americans, um, when they think about Southeast Asia or they think about Vietnam, they might immediately think about the Vietnam conflict. It was not officially a war. War was not declared by Congress, so the correct title would be the Vietnam conflict. 
Okay, um, so the United States was involved in this in the 1960s and early 1970s. The Vietnam conflict can be considered a proxy war in that the U.S. and the USSR um, were fighting but didn't want to fight directly. Again, we're still going to be in that Cold War period, okay? So we didn't want to directly engage with the Soviets, but um, the U.S. had interests here. And the interest that the U.S. had here was regarding communism, okay? So, of course, the USSR was uh, communist, China was communist, we had um, uh, Korean conflicts in the 1950s, which then parts of um, Korea became communist, and so the concern was the domino theory, and the idea is if one country becomes communist, then the country next to it will become communist, and so on and so forth. And so as China became um, communist, the concern was if Vietnam became communist, then after Vietnam, it could go to Laos, could go to Thailand, could go to India, and sh before we know it, the whole realm could be communist. And in the 60s and 70s, the United States was very concerned about communism and, um, and that power structure in between the U.S. and the USSR. Okay, so again, um, Vietnam became independent from France. France moved in after the Japanese left in the 40s. So in the 1950s, Vietnam became independent and it was split along the 17th parallel, which is roughly here-ish, all right? The 17th parallel is gonna be the split between North Vietnam, which was communist, again, bordering China, and South Vietnam, which was capitalist, okay? And so the US um, supported the Southern uh, Vietnamese forces because they wanted to prevent the entire area from becoming communist. And then China um, support the North, and it's gonna be support in terms of supplying weapons, supplying ground forces, okay? So again, the US had ground forces there in the 60s and 70s, okay? 1973, the US withdrew troops, and 1975, all of Vietnam was united under one communist government, okay? As we can look back in history, we, you know, Cambodia and Laos and Thailand did not all become communist, but this domino theory was a major, major influence in this realm when it came to international politics and military interventions um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, again, the Korean War as well, um, would be concerned around this because we couldn't, the U.S. could not directly engage the USSR. We both, they both have nuclear weapons. We can't directly engage with still that, that um, Cold War. But again, these proxy wars where they're kind of fighting it out with um, other countries in their place. That's going to be what happened with the Vietnam conflict. Okay, uh, another thing that we have here in the Southeast Asian realm is something called the Golden Triangle. And this is going to be a large port of uh, Myanmar, actually. So Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand were right through here. Uh, this is going to be opium, opium production. Okay, we, of course, we also see that grown in Afghanistan as well. Opium is very highly grown in Afghanistan. Um, so what happened, so we'll talk more about um, a lot of the, the conflicts in Myanmar, Burma later, but um, when f farmers are forced to move, they're forced to resettle, um, often to higher altitudes, so up at a higher elevation, they feel like they have no choice but to grow opium, okay, because the land at higher elevations cannot um, support things like um, cocoa, I should say coffee, because cocoa also can make cocaine. <laughs> so, um, uh, so can, can make coffee um, or palm oil, right? Um, this happens with, so it's, it's going to be opium. It's going to be opium grown here. We see the same thing with cocoa and cocaine grown through here. And so you have farmers who are forced off their lands, forced to less than stellar land. So they're like, well, I can't really grow anything else except for opium or cocaine or they're being paid more by the government or by different militias to um, supply opium and cocaine. Okay, so a lot of folks who feel like they have nothing else to turn to but to growing these, okay? So high amounts of poverty because, um, you know, this is being in illegal trade and there's gonna be a lot of violence and um, bullying by um, gangs and so on and so forth. So that Golden Triangle is gonna be located, again, Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand on those borders area. And we'll see, um, we'll see more about the, the government 
So, for example, Myanmar is considered to be an authoritarian state. The people there do not have um, many human rights. Um, but that's going to be influencing the global drug trade. Um, that's all I have for you today. And then our next lecture, we'll talk more about the individual countries through here and a lot of their individual economies. We have some amazing economic factors happening here, especially looking at Singapore, which has really kind of revolutionized the realm in terms of trade and economy. Um, don't forget to take a quiz, and I'll see you next time.